the movement ultimately succeeded in destroying serfdom across much of the continent. In England, the practice was almost completely eradicated in the wake of the 1381 revolt. Serfs became free farmers, subsisting on their own lands with free access to commons. Pastures for grazing, forests for game and timber, waterways for fishing and irrigation. They worked for wages if they wanted extra income, rarely under coercion. In Germany, peasants came to control up to 90% of the country's land. And even where feudalistic relations remained intact, conditions for peasants improved significantly. As feudalism fell apart, free peasants began to build a clear alternative. An egalitarian, cooperative society rooted in the principles of local self-sufficiency. The results of this revolution were astonishing in terms of the welfare of commoners. Wages rose to levels higher than ever before in recorded history, doubling or even tripling in most regions, and in some cases rising as much as sixfold. Rents declined, food became cheap, and nutrition improved. Workers were able to bargain for shorter working hours and weekends off, plus benefits like meals on the job and payment for each mile they had to travel to and from work. Women's wages shot up too, narrowing what under feudalism had been a substantial gender pay gap. Historians have described the period from 1350 to 1500 as the golden age of the European proletariat. It was a golden age for Europe's ecology, too. The feudal system had been an ecological disaster. Lords put peasants under heavy pressure to extract from the land and forests while giving nothing back. This drove a crisis of deforestation, overgrazing, and a gradual decline in soil fertility. But the political movement that emerged after 1350 reversed these trends and inaugurated a period of ecological regeneration. Once they won direct control of the land, free peasants were able to maintain a more reciprocal relationship with nature. They managed pastures and commons collectively through democratic assemblies with careful rules that regulated tillage, grazing and forest use. Europe's soils began to recover. The forests regrew. Backlash Needless to say, Europe's elites were not pleased with this turn of events. They considered the high wages scandalous and were irritated that commoners would only hire themselves out for short periods or limited tasks, leaving as soon as they'd had enough income to satisfy their needs. Servants are no masters and masters servants, complained John Gower in Miroir de l'Homme, 1380. As one writer put it in the early 1500s, the peasants are too rich and do not know what obedience means. They don't take law into any account. They wish there were no nobles, and they would like to decide what rent we should get for our lands. And, according to another, the peasant pretends to imitate the ways of the freeman and gives himself the appearance of him in his clothes. During the revolutionary period from 1350 to 1500, Elites suffered what historians have described as a crisis of chronic disaccumulation. As national income was shared more evenly across the population, it became more difficult for nobles to pile up the profits they'd enjoyed under feudalism. This is an important point. We often assume that capitalism emerged somehow naturally from the collapse of feudalism, but in fact such a transition would have been impossible. Capitalism requires elite accumulation, piling up excess wealth for large-scale investment. But the egalitarian conditions of post-feudalist society, self-sufficiency, high wages, grassroots democracy and collective management of resources, were inimical to the possibility of elite accumulation. Indeed, this is exactly what elites were complaining about. What the new society might have grown to look like will never know, for it was brutally crushed. Nobles, the church, and the merchant bourgeoisie united in an organized attempt to end peasant autonomy and drive wages back down. They did so not by reinserting peasants, that had proved to be impossible, 
Rather, they forced them off their land in a violent, continent-wide campaign of evictions. As for the commons, those collectively managed pastures, forests and rivers that sustained rural communities, they were fenced off and privatized for elite use. They became, in a word, property. This process was known as enclosure. Thousands of rural communities were destroyed during the enclosure movement. Crops were ripped up and burned, whole villages razed to the ground. Commoners lost their access to land, forests, game, fodder, water, fish, all the resources necessary for life. And the Reformation added further fuel to the bonfire of dispossession. As Catholic monasteries were dismantled across Europe, their lands were snapped up by nobles and cleared of the people who lived there. Peasant communities didn't go down without a fight, of course, but they had precious little success. In Germany, an organized peasant rebellion in 1525 was defeated in a massacre that left more than 100,000 commoners dead, one of the bloodiest slaughters in world history. In 1549, a rebellion led by Englishman Robert Kett managed to take control of Norwich, the country's second largest city, before the military put them down. 3,500 rebels were massacred and their leaders hanged from the city's walls. A rebellion known as the Midland Revolt in 1607 culminated in an insurrection at Newton, where peasants ended up yet again in armed combat with enclosers. Fifty were executed in the defeat that followed. Over the course of three centuries, huge swathes of Britain and the rest of Europe were enclosed and millions of people removed from the land, triggering an internal refugee crisis. It would be difficult to overstate the upheaval that characterized this period. It was a humanitarian catastrophe. For the first time in history, commoners were systematically denied access to the most basic resources necessary for survival. People were left without homes and food. We don't need to romanticize subsistence life to recognize that enclosure produced conditions that were far worse worse even than under serfdom. In England, the word poverty came into common use for the first time to describe the mass of paupers and vagabonds that enclosure produced, words that prior to this period rarely, if ever, appeared in English texts. Yet, as far as Europe's capitalists were concerned, enclosure was working like magic. It enabled them to appropriate huge amounts of land and resources that had previously been off-limits. Economists have always recognized that some kind of initial accumulation was necessary for the rise of capitalism. Adam Smith called this previous accumulation and claimed that it came about because a few people worked really hard and saved their earnings, an idyllic tale that still gets repeated in economics textbooks but historians see it as naive. This was no innocent process of saving. It was a process of plunder. Karl Marx insisted on calling it primitive accumulation to highlight the barbaric nature of the violence it entailed. But the rise of capitalism also depended on something else. It needed labor, lots of it, and cheap. Enclosure solved this problem too. With subsistence economies destroyed and commons fenced off, people had no choice but to sell their labor for wages, not to earn a bit of extra income as under the previous regime, nor to satisfy the demands of a lord as under serfdom, but simply in order to survive. They became, in a word, proletarians. This was utterly new in world history. Such people were referred to at the time as free laborers, but this term is misleading. True, they were not forced to work as slaves or serfs, but they nonetheless had little choice in the matter, as their only alternative was starvation. Those who controlled the means of production could get away with paying rock-bottom wages, and people would have to take it. Any wage, no matter how small, was better than death. All of this appends the usual story that we're told about the rise of capitalism. This was hardly a natural and inevitable process. 
There was no gradual transition, as people like to assume, and it certainly wasn't peaceful. Capitalism rose on the back of organized violence, mass impoverishment, and the systematic destruction of self-sufficient subsistence economies. It did not put an end to serfdom. Rather, it put an end to the progressive revolution that had ended serfdom. Indeed, by securing virtually total control over the means of production and rendering peasants and workers dependent on them for survival, capitalists took the principles of serfdom to new extremes. People did not welcome this new system with open arms. On the contrary, they rebelled against it. The period from 1500 to the 1800s, right into the Industrial Revolution, was among the bloodiest, most tumultuous times in world history. For human welfare, the consequences of enclosure were devastating. It reversed all of the gains the free peasants had won. According to the economists Henry Phelps Brown and Sheila Hopkins, from the 1500s to the 1700s, Real wages declined by as much as 70%. Nutrition deteriorated and starvation became commonplace. Some of the worst famines in European history struck in the 1500s as subsistence economies were ripped up. The social fabric was left so shredded that between 1600 and 1650, populations across Western Europe actually declined. In England, we can see the imprint of this catastrophe clearly in the historical public health record, Average life expectancy at birth fell from 43 years in the 1500s to the low 30s in the 1700s. We all know that famous quote by Thomas Hobbes, where he says that life in the state of nature was nasty, brutish, and short. He wrote those words in 1651. We read Hobbes as describing a putative condition of misery that existed before capitalism, a problem that capitalism was supposed to solve but exactly the opposite is true. The misery he described was created by the rise of capitalism itself. Indeed, that period was among the poorest, sickest, and most desperate in history. And what Hobbes didn't know is that it was about to get worse. The enclosure movement went further in Britain than anywhere else in Europe. The monarchy had initially sought to limit enclosure, worried about the social crises it was creating. But those limits were abolished after the Civil War of the 1640s and the so-called Glorious Revolution of 1688, when the bourgeoisie assumed control of Parliament and obtained the power to do more or less whatever they pleased. Wielding the full force of the state, they introduced a series of laws, the parliamentary enclosures, that set off a wave of dispossession faster and more far-reaching than anything that had come before. Between 1760 and 1870, Some seven million acres were enclosed by legal writ, about one-sixth of England. By the end of this period, there was almost no common land left in the country. This final, dark episode in the destruction of the English peasant system coincided exactly with the Industrial Revolution. The dispossessed poured desperate and shell-shocked into the cities, where they provided the cheap labour that fueled the dark satanic mills immortalised in the poetry of William Blake. Industrial capitalism took off, but at extraordinary human cost. Simon Schretter, one of the world's leading experts on historical public health data, has shown that this first century of the Industrial Revolution was characterized by a striking deterioration in life expectancy, down to levels not seen since the Black Death in the 14th century. In Manchester and Liverpool, the two giants of industrialization, life expectancy collapsed compared to non-industrialized parts of the country. In Manchester, it fell to a mere 25 years. And it was not just in England. This same effect can be seen in every other European country where it's been studied. The first few hundred years of capitalism generated misery to a degree unknown in the pre-capitalist era. Growth as Colonization Historians have made big strides in understanding how the rise of capitalism depended on enclosure but too often this story ignores the patterns of primitive accumulation that were playing out at the same time beyond Europe's shores as part of the very same process. Across the global south, nature and human bodies were enclosed to an extent that dwarfed what happened within Europe itself. When Europeans began to colonize the Americas in the decades after 1492, they were not driven by the romance of exploration and discovery as our schoolbooks would have it. 
Colonization was a response to the crisis of elite disaccumulation that had been caused by the peasant revolutions in Europe. It was a fix. Just as elites turned to enclosure at home, they sought new frontiers for accumulation abroad. In 1525, the very year that German nobles massacred those hundred thousand peasants, the Spanish King Carlos I awarded the kingdom's highest honor to Hernán Cortés, the conquistador who slayed a hundred thousand indigenous people as his army marched through Mexico and destroyed the Aztec capital of Tenochtitlan. The congruence of these two events is striking. In the decades that inaugurated the rise of capitalism, enclosure and colonization were intimately connected. The scale of colonial appropriation was staggering. From the early 1500s through the early 1800s, colonizers siphoned a hundred million kilograms of silver out of the Andes and into European ports. To get a sense of the scale of this wealth, consider this thought experiment. If invested in 1800 at the historical average rate of interest, that quantity of silver would today be worth $165 trillion, more than double the world's GDP. And that's on top of the gold that was extracted from South America during the same period. This windfall played a key role in the rise of European capitalism. It provided some of the surplus that ended up invested in the Industrial Revolution. It enabled the purchase of land-based goods from the East, which allowed Europe to shift its population from agriculture to industrial production. And it funded the military expansion that powered further rounds of colonial conquest. Colonization also provided the key raw materials that fueled the Industrial Revolution. Take cotton and sugar, for example. Cotton was the most important commodity in Britain's industrial rise, the lifeblood of Lancashire's iconic mills. And sugar became a key source of cheap calories for Europe's industrial workers. But neither cotton nor sugar grow in Europe. To get them, Europeans appropriated vast tracts of land for plantation agriculture, millions of acres across much of Brazil, the West Indies and North America. As for who powered all the mines and plantations, up to five million indigenous Americans were enslaved for this purpose, a process so violent that it wiped out much of the population. But even this was not enough. Another 15 million souls were shipped across the Atlantic from Africa during three centuries of state-sponsored human trafficking. The United States extracted so much labor from enslaved Africans that, if paid at the U.S. minimum wage with a modest rate of interest, it would add up to $97 trillion today, four times the size of the U.S. GDP. And that's just the United States. It doesn't count the Caribbean and Brazil. The slave trade amounted to an extraordinary appropriation of labor transferred from indigenous and African communities into the pockets of European industrialists. But there were also subtler forms of appropriation at work. In India, British colonizers extracted extraordinary sums of money in the form of taxes. Between the years 1765 and 1938, they siphoned the equivalent of $45 trillion out of India and into British coffers. This flow allowed Britain to buy strategic materials like iron, tar and timber, which were essential to the country's industrialization. They also used it to finance the industrialization of white settler colonies like Canada and Australia, and to pay for the British welfare system that, after the 1870s, finally started to address the misery generated by enclosure. Today, British politicians often seek to defend colonialism by claiming that Britain helped develop India. But in fact, exactly the opposite is true. India developed Britain. The point here is that the Industrial Revolution and Europe's industrial growth did not emerge ex nihilo. It hinged on commodities that were produced by slaves, on lands stolen from colonized peoples, and processed in factories staffed by European peasants who had been forcibly dispossessed by enclosure. We tend to think of these as separate processes, but they all operated with the same underlying logic. Enclosure was a process of internal colonization, and colonization was a process of enclosure. Europe's peasants were dispossessed from their lands just as indigenous Americans were, although notably the latter were treated much worse, excluded from the realm of rights and even humanity altogether. And the slave trade is nothing if not the enclosure and colonization of bodies, bodies that were appropriated for the sake of surplus accumulation, just as land was, 
and treated as property in the same way. It might be tempting to downplay these moments of violence as mere aberrations in the history of capitalism. But they are not. They are the foundations of it. Growth has always relied on processes of colonization. All of this added a final piece to the rise of capitalism. You see, Europe's capitalists had created a system of mass production, but they needed somewhere to sell it. Who would absorb all this output? The enclosures provided a partial solution. By destroying self-sufficient economies, they created not only a mass of workers, but also a mass of consumers, people wholly dependent on capital for food, clothes, and other essential goods. But this alone was not enough. They needed to break into new markets abroad. The problem was that much of the global south, particularly Asia, had their own artisanal industries and were uninterested in importing things they could make for themselves. Colonizers solved this problem by using asymmetric trade rules to destroy the south's domestic industries, forcing them to serve not only as a source of raw materials, but also as a captive market for Europe's mass-produced goods. This completed the circuit. But the consequences were devastating. As European capital grew, the South's share of global manufacturing collapsed, from 77% in 1750 down to 13% by 1900. The Paradox of Artificial Scarcity In the wake of enclosure, Europe's peasants, those who remained in rural areas rather than migrating to cities, found themselves subject to a new economic regime. They were back once again under the rule of landlords, but this time in an even worse position. At least under serfdom they had secure access to land. Now they were granted only temporary leases on it. And these weren't just ordinary leases. They were allocated on the basis of productivity. So to retain their access to land, peasants had to devise ways to intensify their production, working longer hours and extracting more from the soil each year. Those who fell behind in this race would lose their tenancy rights and face starvation. This put peasants in direct competition with one another, with their own kin and neighbours, transforming what had been a system of collective cooperation into one organised around desperate antagonism. The application of this logic to land and farming marked a fundamental transformation in human history. It meant that, for the first time, people's lives were governed by the imperatives of intensifying productivity and maximising output. No longer was production about satisfying needs, no longer about local sufficiency. Instead, it was organised around profit. This is crucial. Those principles of Homo economicus that we assume to be engraved in human nature were instituted during the enclosure process. The same pressures were at play in the cities. Refugees from enclosure who ended up in urban slums had no choice but to accept work for meagre wages. Because the refugees were many and jobs were few, Competition among workers drove down the cost of labour, destroying the guild system that had previously protected the livelihoods of skilled craftsmen. Faced with the constant threat of replacement, workers were under pressure to produce as much as was physically possible. They regularly worked for 16 hours a day, significantly longer than they had worked prior to enclosure. These regimes of forced competition generated a dramatic surge in productivity. Between 1500 and 1900, the quantity of grain extracted per acre of land shot up by a factor of four. And it was this feature, known at the time as improvement, that came to serve as the core justification for enclosure. The English landowner and philosopher John Locke admitted that enclosure was a process of theft from the commons and from commoners, but he argued that this theft was morally justifiable because it enabled a shift to intensive commercial methods that increased agricultural output. Any increase in total output, he said, was a contribution to the greater good, the betterment of humanity. The same logic was used to justify colonization and invoked by Locke himself to defend his claims to American lands. Improvement became the alibi for appropriation. Today, the very same alibi is routinely leveraged to justify new rounds of enclosure and colonization, of lands, forests, fisheries, of the atmosphere itself. But instead of improvement, we call it development or growth. Virtually anything can be justified if it contributes to GDP growth.
We take it as an article of faith that growth benefits humanity as a whole, that it is essential to human progress. But even in Locke's time, the alibi was clearly a ruse. While the commercialization of agriculture did increase total output, the only improvement was to the profits of the landowners. While output soared, commoners were hit by two centuries of famine. So too in the factories. None of the gains from the surge in labor productivity went back to the workers themselves. Indeed, wages declined during the enclosure period. Profits were pocketed instead by those who owned the means of production. The essential point to grasp here is that the emergence of the extraordinary productive capacity that characterizes capitalism depended on creating and maintaining conditions of artificial scarcity. Scarcity and the threat of hunger served as the engine of capitalist growth. The scarcity was artificial in the sense that there was no actual depletion of resources. All the same land and forests and waters remained, just as they always had, but people's access to them was suddenly restricted. Scarcity was created, then, in the very process of elite accumulation, and it was enforced by state violence, with peasants massacred wherever they found the courage to tear down the barriers that cut them off from the land. This was a conscious strategy on the part of Europe's capitalists. In Britain, the historical record is full of commentary by landowners and merchants who felt the peasants' access to commons during the revolutionary period had encouraged them to leisure and insolence. They saw enclosure as a tool for enhancing the industry of the masses. Our forests and great commons make the poor that are upon them too much like the Indians, wrote the Quaker John Bellers in 1695. They are a hindrance to industry and are nurseries of idleness and insolence. In 1771, the agriculturalist Arthur Young noted that everyone but an idiot knows that the lower classes must be kept poor or they will never be industrious. The Reverend Joseph Townsend emphasized in 1786 that it is only hunger which can spur and goad them on to labor. Legal constraint, Townsend went on, is attended with too much trouble, violence and noise whereas hunger is not only a peaceable, silent, unremitted pressure, but as the most natural motive to industry, it calls forth the most powerful exertions. Hunger will tame the fiercest animals. It will teach decency and civility, obedience and subjugation to the most brutish, the most obstinate, and the most perverse. Patrick Colquhoun, a powerful Scottish merchant, saw poverty as an essential precondition for industrialization. Poverty is that state and condition in society where the individual has no surplus labor in store or, in other words, no property or means of subsistence but what is derived from the constant exercise of industry in the various occupations of life. Poverty is therefore a most necessary and indispensable ingredient in society without which nations and communities could not exist in a state of civilization. It is the lot of man. It is the source of wealth, since without poverty there could be no labor, there could be no riches, no refinement, no comfort, and no benefit to those who may be possessed of wealth. David Hume, in 1752, built on these sentiments to elaborate an explicit theory of scarcity. "'Tis always observed, in years of scarcity, if it be not extreme, that the poor labor more and really live better." these passages reveal a remarkable paradox. The proponents of capitalism themselves believed it was necessary to impoverish people in order to generate growth. This same strategy was deployed across much of the rest of the world during European colonization. In India, colonizers tried to pressure peasants to shift from subsistence farming to cash crops for export. Opium, indigo, cotton, wheat and rice but Indians were unwilling to make this transition voluntarily. To break their resistance, British officials imposed taxes that plunged peasants into debt, leaving them with no choice but to comply. The British East India Company, and later the Raj, sought to speed this transition along by dismantling the communal support systems the people relied on. They destroyed granaries, privatized the irrigation systems, and enclosed the commons that people used for wood, fodder, and game. The theory was that these traditional welfare systems made people lazy, accustomed to easy food and leisure. By removing them, 
you could discipline people with the threat of hunger and get them to compete with one another to extract ever higher yields from the land. From the perspective of agricultural productivity, it worked, but the destruction of subsistence agriculture and communal support systems left peasants vulnerable to market fluctuations and droughts. During the last quarter of the 19th century, the height of the British Empire, 30 million Indians perished needlessly of famine in what the historian Mike Davis has called the late Victorian holocausts. Needlessly, because even at the peak of the famine there was a net surplus of food. In fact, Indian grain exports more than tripled during this period, from 3 million tons in 1875 to 10 million tons in 1900. This was artificial scarcity taken to new extremes, far worse than anything that was inflicted within Europe. In Africa, colonizers faced what they openly called the labor question, how to get Africans to work in mines and on plantations for low wages. Africans generally preferred their subsistence lifestyles and showed little inclination to do back-breaking work in European industries. The promise of wages was in most cases not enough to induce them into what they considered to be needless labour. Europeans fumed at this resistance and responded by either forcing people off their land, the Native Lands Act in South Africa shoved the black population onto a mere 13% of the country's territory, or forcing them to pay taxes in European currency. Either course of action left Africans with no option but to sell themselves for wages. The same process of enclosure and forced proletarianization played out over and over again during the period of European colonization, not just under the British, but under the Spanish, Portuguese, French, and Dutch as well, with examples too numerous to recite here. In all of these cases, scarcity was created purposefully for the sake of capitalist expansion. How odd that the history of capitalism, a system that generated such extraordinary material productivity, is marked by the constant creation of scarcity, scarred by devastating famines and a centuries-long process of immiseration. This apparent contradiction was first noticed in 1804 by James Maitland, the 8th Earl of Lauderdale. Maitland pointed out that there is an inverse relation between what he called private riches and public wealth, or commons such that an increase in the former can only ever come at the expense of the latter. Public wealth, Maitland wrote, may be accurately defined to consist of all that man desires as useful or delightful to him. In other words, it has to do with goods that have an intrinsic use value even when they are abundant, including air, water and food. Private riches, on the other hand, consist of all that man desires as useful or delightful to him which exists in a degree of scarcity. The scarcer something is, the more money you can extort from people who need it. For instance, if you enclose an abundant resource like water and establish a monopoly over it, you can charge people to access it and therefore increase your private riches. This would also increase what Maitland called the sum total of individual riches, what today we might call GDP but this can be accomplished only by curtailing people's access to what was once abundant and free. Private riches go up, but public wealth goes down. This became known as the Lauderdale Paradox. Maitland recognized that this was happening during the process of colonization. He noticed that colonizers were burning down orchards that produced fruits and nuts, so people who once lived off the natural abundance of the land would be compelled instead to work for wages and purchase food from Europeans. What was once abundant had to be made scarce. Perhaps the most iconic example of this was the salt tax the British Raj imposed on India. Salt was freely available all along India's coasts. All you had to do was bend down and scoop it up. Yet the British made people pay for the right to do this as part of a scheme to produce revenue for the colonial government. Public wealth had to be sacrificed for the sake of private riches commons sabotaged for growth. The Great Separation Enclosure and colonization were necessary preconditions for the rise of European capitalism. It destroyed subsistence economies, created a mass of cheap labor, and by generating artificial scarcity, set the engines of competitive productivity in motion.
Yet, as powerful as these forces were, they were not sufficient to break down the barriers to elite accumulation. Something else was needed, something far subtler but nonetheless equally violent. Early capitalists not only had to find ways to compel people to work for them, they also had to change people's beliefs. They had to change how people regarded the living world. Ultimately, capitalism required a new story about nature. For most of our 300,000-year history, we humans have had an intimate relationship with the rest of the living world. We know that people in early human societies were likely to be able to describe the names, properties, and personalities of hundreds, if not thousands, of plants, insects, animals, rivers, mountains, and soils, in much the same way people today know the most recondite facts about actors, celebrities, politicians, and product brands. Aware that their existence depended on the well-being of other living systems around them, they paid close attention to how those systems worked. They regarded humans as an inextricable part of the rest of the living community, which they saw in turn as sharing the essential traits of humanity. Indeed, the art our ancestors left hidden on stone surfaces around the world suggests that they believed in a sort of spiritual interchangeability between humans and non-human beings. Anthropologists refer to this way of seeing the world as animism, the idea that all living beings are interconnected and share in the same spirit or essence. Because animists draw no fundamental distinction between humans and nature, and indeed in many cases insist on the underlying relatedness, even kinship of all beings, they have strong moral codes that prevent them from exploiting other living systems. We know from animist cultures today that while people, of course, fish, hunt, gather and farm, they do so in the spirit not of extraction but of reciprocity. Just as with gifts exchanged among people, transactions with non-human beings are hedged about with rituals of respect and politeness. Just as we take care not to exploit our own relatives, so animists are careful to take no more than ecosystems can regenerate and give back by protecting and restoring the land. In recent years, anthropologists have come to see this as more than just a cultural difference. It is deeper than that. It's a fundamentally different way of conceptualizing the human. It's a different kind of ontology, an ontology of interbeing. This ontology came under attack with the rise of empires, which gradually came to see the world as split in two, with a spiritual realm of gods separate from and above the rest of creation. Humans were given a privileged place in this new order, made in the image of the gods themselves, and thus possessed of the right to rule over the rest of creation. This idea, the principle of dominion, grew firmer during the Axial Age, with the rise of transcendental philosophies and religions across the major Eurasian civilizations. Confucianism in China, Hinduism in India, Zoroastrianism in Persia, Judaism in the Levant, and Sophism in Greece. We can see it spelled out in ancient Mesopotamian texts dating back 3,000 years, and perhaps nowhere is this clearer than in Genesis itself. And God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over everything that creeps upon the ground. In the 5th century BC, this new way of seeing the world received a boost from Plato, who built his whole philosophy on the idea of a transcendental realm separate from an earthly realm. The transcendental realm was the source of abstract truth and reality, the ideal essence of things, while the material world was but a poor imitation, a mere shadow. This idea came to inform the Christian notion of a spiritual heaven set in opposition to a worldly realm of mere matter, sinful, decaying and passing away. Indeed, the Church and the Christian Roman Empire that expanded across Europe vigorously sponsored the Platonic view, which came to be formalized in the doctrine of contemptus mundi, contempt for the world. But despite the rise of these new ideas, most people held firm to relational ontologies. Even among philosophers, counter-discourses remained strong. Aristotle, Plato's most famous student, publicly rejected transcendentalism, insisting that the essence of things lies within them 
not in some ethereal elsewhere, and that all beings have souls and share versions of the same spirit. Building on Aristotle, many philosophers regarded the living world itself as an intelligent organism or even as a deity. Cicero wrote in the 2nd century BC that the world is a living and wise being. It reasons and feels and all its parts are interdependent. For the Stoics, who were influential in Athens during the 1st century, God and matter were synonymous, and therefore matter itself pulsed with divinity. The Roman philosopher Seneca saw the earth as a living organism, with springs and rivers flowing through her like blood through veins, with metals and minerals forming slowly in her womb, and morning dew like perspiration on her skin. These ideas remained prominent in so-called pagan cultures across Europe, which rejected the Christian distinction between sacred and profane. They regarded the living world, plants and animals, mountains and forests, rivers and rain, as enchanted, filled with spirits and divine energy. As Christendom expanded through Europe, it sought to repress these ideas wherever it encountered them, as in the persecution of the Celtic Druids but it never succeeded in stamping them out. They remained common currency among peasants. In fact, after 1200, animistic ideas enjoyed a striking revival as new translations of Aristotle's texts became available in Europe and gave legitimacy to peasant beliefs. And in the wake of the peasant rebellions, as feudalism collapsed after 1350 and commoners wrested control of the land from feudal lords, these ideas became openly accepted. We can trace animistic ontologies all the way to the Renaissance, where even then the dominant view regarded the material world as animated and saw the earth as a living, nurturing mother. In the 15th century, Pico della Mirandola wrote, All this great body of the world is a soul, full of intellect and of God, who fills it within and without and vivifies the all. The world is alive. All matter is full of life. Matter and bodies or substances are energies of God. In the all, there is nothing which is not God. But then something happened. In the 1500s, there were two powerful factions of European society who were worried about the striking revival of animistic ideas and set out to destroy them. One was the church. As far as the clergy were concerned, the notion that spirits suffused the material world threatened their claim to be the only conduits to the divine and the only legitimate proxies of divine power. This was a problem not only for priests, but also for the kings and aristocrats who ultimately depended on their sanction. Animistic ideas had to be defeated because they were loaded with subversive implications. If spirit is everywhere, then there is no God. And if there is no God, then there is no priest and no king. In such a world, the divine right of kings crumbles into incoherence. And that's exactly what happened. The ideas of Aristotle inspired many of the medieval peasant rebellions that sought to overthrow feudalism. These movements were denounced by the church as heretical, and the charge of heresy was used to justify brutal violence against them. But there was another powerful faction that regarded animist ideas as a problem. Capitalists. The new economic system that began to dominate after 1500 required a new relationship with the land, with the soils, and with the minerals beneath the surface of the earth. One built on the principles of possession, extraction, commodification, and ever-increasing productivity, or, in the discourse of the time, improvement. But in order to possess and exploit something, you must first regard it as an object. In a world where everything was alive and pulsing with spirit and agency, where all beings were regarded as subjects in their own right, this sort of possessive exploitation, in other words, property, was ethically unfathomable. The historian Carolyn Merchant argues that animistic ideas limited the extent to which people considered it permissible to plunder the earth. The image of the earth as a living organism and nurturing mother had served as a cultural constraint restricting the actions of human beings, she writes. One does not readily slay a mother, dig into her entrails for gold or mutilate her body. As long as the earth was considered to be alive and sensitive, 
it could be considered a breach of human ethical behavior to carry out destructive acts against it. This is not to say that people didn't extract from the land or mine the mountains. They did. But they did so with careful decorum and rituals of respect. Miners, smiths and farmers offered